Yeah, no, nah, it's all right. I was just, I just put us in the wrong corner. I wasn't really thinking about where we were. Yeah. Oh, Saturday night. Saturday night. Hey, Kerry, how are you? You well? Yeah, good. And I just saw that, that we're going to be missed. Are we we're going to be missed. Yes. And we've only got one more night after this. I know, but we've got two more incredible bunches of athletes tonight and tomorrow night. So. That is so Ooh. true. That is so true. Welcome, everyone, to the Cup of Life Cafe as the room slowly warms up. Uh, please make sure that you use the chat room and do what you do every single night that you have been on. Uh, but like what we do every single night, we want to make you aware of raising funds and donations for the Australian Sports Foundation. Uh, 70,000 clubs are seeking $1.2 billion due to COVID to support themselves through this tough time. 16,000 of those clubs are in real trouble and could be shutting their doors in the next six months. So even if you've attended this series over this whole period of time, please do dip into your pockets greatly and, and support all these community clubs. All donations are tax deductible. Uh, so please feel free to make those donations by clicking in the offers area. Play nice, be kind, get interactive, ask plenty of questions like you have been doing. I think Rob, I think Rob is probably the standout question asker so far. Carry on, just putting it out there. Um, and finally, please make sure you also share it across your social channels as well. Tag us all and including our incredible athletes uh, by finding them on their in Insta or Facebook or LinkedIn handles. Uh, take a lot of screen grabs and share that along. In, in particularly, why not share right now? Because the more the merrier in this room. And uh, carry over to you to do the lovely introductions. Uh, thank you, Luke. Two more nights. I'm so excited, but I'm excited for tonight because tonight would have been day 15 of the Summer Olympics in Tokyo 2020. But as you all know, it's postponed to next year. But tonight, if the Olympics were on, we would have seen the gold medal in the men's 10 metre platform diving and the gold medal in the women's water polo. So I want to welcome into the Cupper of Life Cafe two of the goats of their sports. That's greatest of all time. They're not goats. They don't look like goats, but they are the greatest of all time in their sports. Maddie Mitchum and Debbie Watson. Please join us, guys. Turn those cameras on so we can see you and hear you. Oh. Yay, we've got you. Hi, guys. How are you tonight? Matthew, you're in Melbourne. Deb, you're in Sydney. All going well in Melbourne? I don't know. My husband got a COVID test uh, yesterday morning, so we are like, you have to behave as if you're positive anyway. Well, both of us do. Um, so we've just been in the house for the last two days, like, and have not seen the outside world. So I don't know how Melbourne is. Apparently, it's a bit of a shitstorm. Yeah, it's a bit quiet. So fingers crossed for the hubby and for you and for everyone else down in Melbourne. And um, let's. I, I want to start with you, Matt, and just ask you, if the Olympics were on, yes. where would you have been? Would you have been in Tokyo or would you have been somewhere in a pub watching it on TV or on the couch at home? What would you have been doing? Um, I probably, I mean, I don't drink, so um, so being around lots and lots of drunk people when you don't drink is really annoying. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I would have been on the couch or I would have been there. Um, I, um, yeah, I'm hoping to still be able to commentate, um, but whether that's, um, you know, from Australia or in Tokyo, I don't mind. I just love being involved. What about you, Deb? Would you be been there commentating? Yeah, I would have been actually, but uh, in Australia. So, yeah, definitely uh, feeling a little bit um, sort of sad for the athletes particularly, but also a little bit for myself because I would have been, yeah, having a nice time and watching amazing water polo and all other sports, of course. So, yeah, it's, it's been a tough time for everyone, I think. Yeah. Well, Matthew, two Olympics for you, Beijing and London, and it was in Beijing 2008 that you produced the highest scoring dive in Olympic history to win the 10 metre platform. Look at that body twisting and, and turning and I don't know how you did it. Um, and you were, you became the first male diving gold medalist in 84 years to get that amazing score. Mm -hmm. Four tens, so almost perfect. I think four tens, two nines and a 9.5. So yep. yep. Um, so it's, I was the first um, male Australian to win an Olympic gold medal in 84 years. 
Um, and that dive, um, it's still the highest scoring dive in Olympic history. So it will be beaten um, one day. Um, but, uh, and I think the one thing that I'm probably proudest of, um, you know, because there have already been other Olympic champions since, um, my, my record dive will be beaten. But the one thing they can't take away from me is that I believe I'm the first openly gay um, Olympic gold medalist, um, at least male, um, as far as I know. So, in um, the world or in Australia? In the world. Wow. So that's um, something that no one will ever be able to take away from me. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that in a sec too. We had Natalie Cook and uh, Daniel Kowalski on last night. We talked about their journeys, you know, with their sex sexuality in sports. So we're going to get to that in a sec. Um, six, I also want to mention that you had six other silver medals in the Com Games. So oh, yeah. the Olympics, you did do uh, very well in other competitions, but you started off trampolining and you're a pretty successful junior. Um, mm -hmm. How did you get go from trampolining to diving? Um, it happened by chance. Um, I My mum used to treat the local pool as um, like all day daycare. So she'd drop me off at like nine o'clock in the morning and pick me up at 5.30 in the evening. And my local pool just happened to be the Sleeman Sports Complex, which is the national training center for diving. Um, and so this is back in the olden days when the boards used to be open to the public for an hour here or an hour there. And, um, you know, everyone was showing off doing bomb dives and I was Sorry, everybody was doing bomb dives and I was showing off, doing double flips into bomb dives. And um, the national coach just happened to be walking out along pool deck um, at, the, at that time and saw me and was like, we're starting up a, a talent identification squad. You should come along next week. And so that was it. it basically, it was all because I was showing off. <laughs> and isn't it, isn't it interesting how, like, it's just a sliding doors moment. That if he wasn't there, maybe you'd gone as a trampolinist, maybe like Jai Wallace, you could have picked up a medal in trampolining, but instead you went to diving. Um, that's pretty cool. I love that story. Deb, you were the only female water player, a water polo player oh, yeah. in the world to have gone and won gold in the World Cup, the World Champs and the Olympics. And I read so much about you today. Arguably, you are the finest water polo player ever because you were the best in the world. You were voted the best player in the world in 1993. Your career spans 17 years. Don't feel old while I'm reading this. And you captained Australia from 91 to 95 and then again after that. Such an impressive playing career. How did it all start for you? Uh, well, I had a background of uh, swimming and netball. So pretty much I just wanted to do, I wanted to play for Australia. I didn't care in which one i just wanted to go for australia somewhere and then netball was probably my preferred sport but i had um stuffed my knee so at 14 i had my right knee reconstructed um and then again at 15 and that was it the doctor actually said you know that's it there's no more netball for for you in fact you can only if you run you're only allowed to run in a straight line um, I was Devo, of course, and, you know, I, I just sort of picked up swimming a bit, but my heart wasn't really in it, and I just happened to be listening at school one day when they made an announcement, and they just said, you know, who wants to play a water polo on Friday nights at Ringer Aquatic Centre, and I was with the water girls, like the beachy girls, and we go, isn't that where the boys go on Friday nights? So we thought, <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's go and try it, and, uh, yeah, so we went and tried it, and, yeah, it all happened pretty quickly after that, but, yeah, it was uh, a funny, funny what the motivation was to actually go and sign up so yeah it was an injury way back when I was 14 really 15 that set me off on the path yeah well what a combination netball and swimming because that's pretty much both skills all together but I thought doing the egg beater I thought that was bad for your knees no, it doesn't hurt it at all. In fact, it's probably one of the things, the only thing that doesn't hurt it even now, like walking, because I've had it uh, had it operated again when I was 21, um, just through just lots of other wear and tear stuff happening. And it's probably the only thing that doesn't hurt it now. Um, you know, breaststroke is, um, I don't like breaststroke. It makes it angry. Um, you know, lots of other things do. But yeah, for some reason, egg beater, egg beater was good. Well, Matt, I want to ask you, because we all remember back in, I think it was, 84, I'm not sure what year, Greg Leganis, the famous jump off the, the three-metre springboard and he came through in the Olympics, smacked his head open, five stitches, concussion, and then 30 minutes later he's back out there winning a gold medal. Like 
Did you know about this when you started diving and was it something that a fear that you had to overcome? Um, I did. Um, that was, I believe that was Soul 88. Oh, yeah. um, uh, and it, um, yeah, he was always my, uh, I guess, my sporting idol. Um, one, because, I mean, look how pretty he is. Even when he's smacking his head on the board, <laughs> he's just so pretty. <laughs> you know, so um, that's gold, really. Um, but, yeah, because he was, like, far, far uh, leaps and bounds. Um, more diving puns um, ahead of um, the, the competition, like ahead of his time, really. Um, so yeah, he was an easy person to to uh, to to idolise, really. Um, so much so that I was actually reading his um, autobiography uh, when I was going into the Beijing Olympics to see if I could get like some sort of I don't know magical gold medalist insight to figure out how to win the Olympics, um, and it worked. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Um, as far as uh, tips on uh, like fear around not hitting, not hurting yourself. I mean, starting diving at, at twelve, I think, um, is basically like you feel it. And so I'm pretty glad that I, um, you know, did start youngish, um, and uh, you know, I was pretty fearless, and that I learned a lot of the my skills on ten meter quite young, um, because. It wasn't until my late twenties when that that self preservation mechanism started to kick in, and I was standing on the end of the platform, going, "I could die." Well, surely there are much better, much safer ways to earn half as much money, like you know, like half as much money as a full time job, you know. So um, that was kind of the beginning of the end for me. Yeah, uh, it would have been. Yeah, it's interesting. Why is it that as we get older, it becomes more fearful? Because you know you just jumping off feet first off the 10 meter platform is the scariest thing I've ever done. But then once you're in the water, it's like, oh, that was easy. Why do you think that is? Um, I don't know. I think it's, um, you know, when your body starts feeling like not, not reacting as quickly or, you know, it's a bit slower or it's not quite as strong, um, then it, it, you, it, there's a lot of compensation in the air as far as diving goes. Um, and so, um, you know, the more you're compensating, the more variables you're throwing into the mix, um, which adds more um, risk. Um, and so, you know, the, I mean, the, the fear came from like actually having a few accidents and, and going, you know, then starting to be a bit tentative and hesitant and, you know, and gathering evidence that, um, <laughs> you know, I was never going to, um, be back where I was when I was 20 years old. So what were some of the worst ones? Like, did you hit your head on any of the boards or was it just the landing into the water? Never my head, but I hit my feet a couple of times, which, um, you know, completely just knocked me off course and, and ended up in huge wipeouts off 10 metre. Um, and they hurt enough. Um, you know, you get this when you smack on the water, you get this, like, a momentary flash of whiteness and your ears ring and then the pain like just starts searing throughout your whole body. Um, and then the embarrassment is <laughs> the worst. <laughs> so have you ever done a belly flop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, one time I, I did hit the platform with my feet and got completely discombobulated um, in the air. Uh, and this was, you know, during a, um, a, a swimming carnival at the time, so it was Saturday morning training. Um, and there were thousands and thousands of, um, you know, teenage boys just all along the, in the grandstands. Um, and, you know, I've hit the platform and just wiped out. So it hit the water so flat that I did not sink at all. And, you know, my face was swelling up, you know, like I, my lip was swelling up and, um, you just have to get like straight back on the horse. So, you know, like I went straight back up and, and absolutely nailed it because I didn't want to let the fear creep in. Um, so you just have to kind of like, you know, reset straight away, get back up straight away. Well, for seven years you were at the AIS, mm -hmm. I believe, and then at the tender age of 18 you decided to retire. Yeah. So what was going on there? Were you just like over it? Was it just getting all too hard? Um, so I was not enjoying um, diving for... Uh, in fact, you know, I was probably I was going through a lot of stuff um, from about the age of fourteen to eighteen. Um, you know, like I was having issues at home, and 
you know, I got kicked out at 14 and, um, and then, you know, I was also having some issues within the training environment, feeling very alienated because, you know, there was, I guess I was starting to realize and everybody else was starting to realize that I was very different in a very flamboyant kind of way. Um, but I didn't want to admit to, I didn't want to come out to everybody that I'd been training with because that felt like admitting that I'd been effectively deceiving these people that I've been training with for six hours a day, six days a week for the last three years, you know? So yeah, I didn't want to kind of, yeah, I felt stuck basically. Mm. Um, so, you know, there was troubles at home. There was troubles within the training environment where I was feeling very alienated. And so I, you know, I, I started, I'd slipped into this pretty profound period of depression from 14 to 18. And, um, you know, the coach, even the coaches sort of um, had a very, there was a, a cultural difference and his coaching style was corrections only. And so hearing everything through this filter of depression um, and low, low self-esteem, corrections just sounded like criticisms. And so, um, you know, the only reason I really stuck in and held onto it for that long was because I saw diving as being my only ticket to being special. But by the time I got to 18, it just wasn't enough for me. So I quit. Yeah, difficult to deal with. We'll get back to that in a sec. I want to speak to Deb about the difficulty of your um, pathway through the first few years of your sport because you were um, not part of the Olympic campaign. The men's water polo was, but the women weren't. And you were one of the leaders in the campaign to bring it to the Olympics. You tried in 84, 88, 92 and 96 all throughout that period you guys were campaigning to get women's water polo in the Olympics with no luck. And that's when you retired. How was it at that point? Were you really bitter? Oh, I guess you were still competing for Australia and you're with your mates, you're in a good environment, you're winning, but how did you feel when you retired? Like you just lucked out and there was no chance? Uh, no, not really, because I sort of, I wouldn't call it retirement. I had a bit of a, um, well, I didn't have a disagreement. The current national coach, or at the time, um, just had a different vision for the team. So, as you said, I'd been in that team from 83 through to 95. In 95, we played um, the World Cup in Sydney. It was the first time at the Homebush Pool that the World Cup had been decided. I was captain of that team and we won. Um, so it was in, like, uh, late September, October. And then early the next year, we had nationals and the coach at the time, he basically said to me, um, uh, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but I can't guarantee you captaincy. Um, you know, I can't guarantee you a p place in the squad. I can't guarantee you a place in the game and, uh, and the team. And I was like, well, if I'm good enough, are you going to pick me? And he was like, you know, he sort of didn't really answer. And I just thought, you know, how disrespectful for uh, someone to come and do that because I had done nothing wrong. Um, if anything, the only thing I'd ever be guilty of is standing up for my teammates because I have always been so important for me. Loyalty is such a, an important um, factor to get your team performing well. So, you know, I went to the um, president of Australian Water Polo at the time and I said to them, this is or him, this is what's happening. And he, he was basically, you know, he, the, the coach that we're speaking about, he, he was part of the boys club. He'd been to the Olympics himself. He pretty much, you know, ran his own race. And they just went, well, you know, it's his team, his sole selector, and, you know, what can we do? And I'm like, what do you mean, what can you do? And I thought, well, I'm going to take a stand, you know. And so I basically just said, well, I'm not standing if that's your, you know, if that's how you're going to treat me because I don't deserve it. Uh, so I didn't really go into retirement. I sort of had a little hiatus that was sort of self-imposed but also um, just out of necessity, I think, for standing up for women's water polo. Because we were certainly the second tier uh, within the water polo hierarchy, uh, hierarchy, there was no real, um, you know, support for the women, uh, which was incredibly uh, disappointing. And so I was, I was still training. I was still playing for New South Wales. I still went to Australian Club Championships, and so it wasn't like I wasn't fit. I was still, you know, and I actually really desperately wanted to play in the World Championships over in Perth in '98. But he was still the coach, so it wasn't until women's water polo was announced. Um, you know, that I, I then went, well, you know, am I going to let someone else determine my fate or am I going to come back and have another go at it? So, you know, of course I chose to, to have a go because I thought I've got nothing to lose. No one can take anything from me. It, you know, it's only going to be an add-on bonus for me even though I was pretty old by that stage and uh, obviously it panned out particularly well. Um, Deb, I just want to ask because it seems absolutely ludicrous to me that um, the men's water polo had been in forever and a day and the women's weren't. What were, what were the reasoning behind well, that? 
the, the the problem was we were lied to the whole time. So, you know, with the Olympic Games, of course, the numbers are capped at an Olympic Games, whether it be 10,200 athletes and swimming uh, or aquatics has a certain a, a number of athletes as well. So, you know, for water polo teams, there's 13 players and there was eight or 12 or 16 teams um, as it was towards the end for the men. But, you know, if you look at the size of a, um, you know, so you've got 13 players that will represent a team. Now, I'm picking on swimming a little bit here, but for the eight by 100 relay, you can have eight athletes go to the Olympics, you know, and four of them will swim in the heat and four of them will swim in the final and they'll all get one medal, right? Mm. They, they weren't prepared to give positions away so women's water polo could have, um, you know, an event um, and they were, were never going to increase the number of aquatic athletes. So we were always battling to get one of the other aquatic disciplines to say, well, okay, well, we'll decrease our numbers. And, you know, numerous times over that, that period, there were times we were definitely told that we were going, you guys will definitely be in, you'll definitely be in. They went in, closed door, we lost 18 to, nip, to zip. It's like, what? You guys, you know, so it just became a, a battle. And we all know what, um, you know, federations who run sports are like, um, which is most unfortunate. It's not only in aquatic sports, that's for sure, it's everywhere. Um, and so we were, we were victims of that. And it was nothing more than discrimination because the men's water polo had been in for 100 years by the time we got there. And it wasn't like we weren't capable. We'd been playing in World Cups, World Championships. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, it was just discrimination. Yeah, absolutely crazy. Well, thank goodness they somehow came to their senses. And I know there was an event in 97 when Juan Antonio Samaranch came out to check on Sydney's progress and there was a little protest. <laughs> little, yeah, most definitely. Well, that was the end result. <laughs> but the uh, protest was, and, and I didn't go to this, so there was about, it was in a winter's night um, and it was Sydney Airport and, of course, Sam Ranch at that particular time was coming out to check on how the uh, facilities were going and they were well above. And so, he's you know, he's pretty confident. He comes out through the main, you know, entrance where now public figures would never come out. They usher them out the back. And there was about 60 girls all in their costumes with banners, you know, basically saying discrimination, women's water polo for Sydney 2000. Um, and, you know, it was sort of quite funny. It was, um, you know, they ushered him off. And then two days later, I think it was, there was a, a media conference with him, you know, to say how proud he was and how everything was going so well. Um, and then there was Liz, who was our goalie, Lizzie Weeks, and uh, Kirsten Binney, who had played for Australia previously, Lizzie's sister and another couple. And they, they basically barged into the media conference with they were enclosed this time but you know saying you know we demand inclusion and if you don't put us in we're going to protest at the 98 world champs over in Perth and if you don't we're going to come back and we're going to you know play up again in front of and you're going to be embarrassed um and thankfully he was a wise man and uh he decided that we could have a go and yeah that that picture's the end result oh good on the girls for doing that and putting themselves like yeah it would have been hard to do that because they were kind of I guess risking their own selection by doing something that wasn't, you know, the, the, the right thing to do. Um, oh, now I just forgot what, oh, that's what I was going to say. Deb, where were you when they announced that it was going to be in and what was your reaction? Yeah, well, actually, it was, um, I mean, I was still in touch with the girls, but I was actually just at home. I'd been at work. I was sitting on the lounge watching the news, and I remember it coming on Channel 10, and they, you know, it was a sport was coming up, then they had a special announcement, and then I saw the water polo girls, and I was like, oh, what's this? Because I had no idea, and and then there was Taryn, Yvette, and uh, I think Liz and Bronnie, they were all sitting there announcing that women's water polo was going to be played in Sydney for the first time, and, uh, you know, obviously, I was elated for the girls, but I was devastated for myself it was it was I didn't have time to think too much about anything I just thought that's just crazy I've got to go you know and I just instantly um, decided that I would give it a go and you know it just joined in the celebration side of it I didn't want to think too much about the fact that I wasn't there um, a lot of it for me really depended on a change of coach and I did know that that was a possibility um, and then obviously we got Ishvan Gorgeny, our, our Hungarian coach. And, you know, he, he the first time he saw me play a tournament, he we spoke and he just said, why aren't you in the team? Um, you know, I explained to him what had happened and he said, I'm just going to pick the best people. I'm just going to pick the best players. And I went, yep, that's all I need to hear. And away I went. So, yeah, I was, I was super lucky. And they put you back. No, no, no luck here. They put you back <laughs> and they oh. announced you were captain as well. 
No, I wasn't captain of the Olympic team. I was captain. Uh, Bridget Gustafson was captain of the Olympic team. So, you know, it, look, it was hard work to get back in that team because, you know, as my husband tells me <laughs> that, you know, you've got a glass of water and you're part of that glass of water. If you've got a finger in it, you pull it out. There's no there's no sign of you ever been there, right? So you've got to fight your whole way back in. It was never like I had a toe still in that water. Um, mm -hmm. There were people that were in my spot and um, I, I needed to get them out to get myself back in. So, you know, I went from being the captain of a World Cup winning team to be the, let's say, the shitter, basically. I know I'm not supposed to swear, but that's what I was. And I had to just, you know, make my way up. And it was difficult because, <laughs> did I, did I just, uh, you know, like it was really difficult because the people that were in the team were my friends as well, you know, that, and I just had to battle my way back in. Well, Matt, that goes back to you battling your way back in. So you were out um, for about how long were you out? Six months or so? Uh, a bit longer. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, it was because I remember it took me about six months for me to stop hating the sport um, and then like another three months for me to even start missing it. And um, and that's when I got a text message from uh, a coach in Sydney um, because I, you know, I was in Brisbane. Um, and, you know, the text message said, look, if you ever want to start diving again, I will always have a place in my squad for you. And so it was just the way that that text message was worded, you know, just a really nurturing, not pushy, like no strings attached kind of way. And I knew this guy and I knew this guy cared for my welfare as a human being more than my welfare as just an athlete. And so, I, yeah, I knew that he would be the guy that, I, you know, that I could get back into it with. Um, so, um, yeah, but it wasn't easy. Like, um you know, it, there was it was a it was a centralized program back when I was coming back, and you know I think I'd left a sour taste in some people's mouths um, when I left, and so you know having moved to another city and and start trying to start training again outside of the national program, um, I was kind of blocked by the higher ups. Um, you know, yeah, they just tried, they said that they had a rule that like you couldn't represent Australia unless you were diving in the national program and I wasn't. And so I had to enlist the help of, um, you know, some other powerful people to get the rules changed. And I did. And it's such an interesting, both of you have got so, so many similarities in that area that, you know, you had, you had to not only fight your way back to physical and emotional, um, tip top shape. You had to fight the hierarchy, you know, you're doing things, you know, on the side to get back in, you're outside of the program, Matt. We were outside of the program leading into Sydney 2000 as well until you kind of have, you know, until you prove that you're back at that level or at that level and they put their arm around you and, and then, you know, all is good again. Um, but I believe there was somebody who mentored you when you moved to Melbourne. Was that the lady on this call perhaps? Can you yeah. not remember? <laughs> <laughs> well, you had a little bit, little bit to do with each other, which I didn't know about. We've had quite a bit to do with each other over the years, haven't we? We have indeed. Yeah, no, it was amazing for me to have the opportunity to, I was working at N-Swiss at the time and they said, you know, would you be interested? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, for sure. And then when I met Matt, it was like, oh, wow, he's amazing. And my God, can he eat? He used to meet at the muffin break over at Homebush, usually after or maybe even before he would train and we'd just have a great chat and, you know, talk about life. And it's nice because... You know, I, I knew people that he was working with, um, but also too, you know, it's like you can just tell me anything because I'm not going to go and tell anyone. And it's, sometimes it's just it's a bit like, you know, going to somewhere we can just blurb it all out. Um, you know, it's nice. It was it was a really positive, um, you know, thing for me to do too. And when's that book coming out, Deb, that you were talking about before about Matt? <laughs> <laughs> He's already told it. I know nothing. <laughs> I know so nothing. Matt Matt, going into Beijing, first openly gay male athlete, um, did you enjoy the extra attention or did yeah. it distract you? <laughs> <laughs> I love all the attention. I'm like a massive attention, um, what's the appropriate word? Um, lover, attention lover. <laughs> lover, that's it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it came about because I... Like in that sort of, um, you know, nine months that I'd had off, um, I had gotten, I don't know, I, I made a promise to myself that I was going to be 100% upfront and honest with everyone I met from that point forward because I'd had that experience of 
not feeling like not being open with people and I hated it. And so when I came back, this coach, Java, he actively, you know, actively created this very welcoming uh, training environment where I knew that I was accepted for exactly who I was so much so. And I'd gotten so used to being so upfront and honest that um, when I did make the team um, and the Sydney Morning Herald was profiling me and a couple of my teammates in the lead up to the games, um, the journalist was just asking all the run of the mill questions, you know, how old I was, where I live, who I live with. And so I very comfortably just blurted out, oh, yeah, I live with my boyfriend. And you should have seen her eyes light up. Like, <laughs> no, no, um, I've got the scoop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, she, while she was, you know, saying that she thought that everybody would be very, very supportive, um, she was also very respectful and, and gave me the option of whether I, or not I wanted that to go into the, the story because, I mean, I don't know if there were any other out sort of uh, Olympians at the time and, um, and, and you know. Natalie, Natalie probably the only female that I, I knew of. Yeah, um, and, you know, and there's you know, the, the stigma that the gays don't get the big endorsement deals. and But, like, I, so I did have go away and think about it, but at the end of the day, I wanted Australia to know exactly who they were supporting if they chose to get behind me. Um, there is a sex joke in there. Um <laughs> Oh, I missed it, totally. Me too. Um, but, yeah, because... I, I got it. I got it. <laughs> got it. Um, I, yeah, it was more important for me even to, even if I didn't have any, even if nobody decided to support me, it was more important for me to be authentic. And um, and it actually ended up being the most wonderful, it, it was the best choice I ever made um, because it was, I had 99.9% .9 overwhelming positive supportive feedback from the public and the media um so my public sort of coming out was like front page of the sydney morning herald which was pretty epic and um and i gained this enormous community from all around the world so um it was a, it was nothing but a positive experience and um yeah and also it would have saved a really awkward sort of coming out mm. experience in case i did very well which I was sort of expecting to do pretty well because the way my progress was trajecting um, towards the Olympics, like I actually won the last major international event before the Games. So, you know, I knew that there was a chance I would do well. Well, just getting to the Games, I think, was a major feat because, as you mentioned before, depression, um, self-harm, which yeah. you wrote about in your book, um, and addiction as well, you know, in that period. There was a lot of stuff going on in your life, you know, maybe at the same time, different times, but just getting there was a challenge. So I guess having that positive response would have really given you the boost that you needed. Yeah, it, it absolutely was. Um, and it, in fact, because that experience was so positive, you know, this, this experience of sharing with the public, because I had such an overwhelmingly positive experience that ended up dictating, um, you know, the, it, the information that I released in my autobiography in 2012, where I did share about my history with mental ill health and addiction to, to crystal meth and my recovery from that as well. I nearly didn't put the drug stuff in the book um, because it's like, it was really sort of controversial and I was still competing um, and but I, I thought back to when I shared um, my sexuality and, and how wonderfully I was held and supported and, um, and the benefits of that. And so I ended up putting everything in the book as well. And exactly, exactly the same experience. Um, you know, it not only did I get a lot of support, but um, the effect that it had on others um, was also incredibly powerful. And people, you know, would share, share lots and lots of stuff with me. And, um, you know, so that it, was a, it was a very validating experience. Yeah, a real cathartic experience to be able to put all that out there and very vulnerable, very courageous and, like you said, fantastic for people who are also doing it tough to, to see that someone has gone through it all and succeeded and obviously like, we're all still struggling with things daily in our life, yeah. especially now at the moment where, you know, you're shut down in Melbourne, 
things aren't looking that great here in Sydney. We don't know. It's that uncertainty. So having having the inspiration, and that's why we put this series together because we want to inspire people. We want we didn't want the Olympic period to come and go. Everyone's waited so long for this. Um, so we wanted to continue in, to inspire people with these stories of, you know, whether it's been hardship or whether it's been winning all the way, whatever it is, there's all different stories. Um, Deb, I want to take you back to the gold medal match. We all remember the last goal, 1.3 seconds on the clock. Um, Evie, event mm -hmm. making that, that, that last goal. Let's just wind it back a little bit because you guys played, I think, six, Six games in seven days yep. during the Sydney event. That is hard, Yaka. How long does a game go for and how do you feel at the end of it? Because do you, I know when if I've been in the water a long time and it's like ugh, the whole body just feels like it's been through a ringer, um, six games in seven days, is has that been done since? No, no, they don't do it anymore. They have a day off. They have a rest day in between now. Um, yeah, look, it was exhausting. And it was funny too because our games are all at 2 p.m. So we always, water polo, uh, we would never be underdone. We would, if anything, we would be overdone. So for us, yes, playing those um, six games and playing at 2 p.m., we had to have a, a land training session. Normally you would always have a, a water session in the morning for an hour beforehand just to run through and, you know, loosen up. We didn't have uh, the opportunity to do that because it just wasn't enough time. So we used to do like a, a land-based circuit every morning and then we would play. And then after our game, we'd, you know, get out, we'd do what we need. People would go and do drug tests, whatever it was. And we'd actually get back in the water and spend another 30 minutes or so after doing our tactics for the next game because our next game was at 2 p.m. It was just the, the nature of the draw. Um, so, yeah, certainly by the end of it, we did have a, uh, a rest day right at the very end um, just before. And, you know, our, our goal scoring, you know, 4-3, that's just so low, so low for, a, you know, a water polo game. Um, you know, most of the other games are around 8-9, you know, 7-8-9 are around there. So, you know, it was a real slugfest. Everyone was exhausted. Um, you know, the quality of the game is still surprisingly good for what it is not that I've watched the game I've seen a vet's goal like a squillion times I've seen those last probably minute and a half of that game um you know never in doubt that a vet was going to get it uh when when equalized I was actually in the water I had played a lot more that tournament than I was expecting um we had people that had injuries throughout. I was a utility player, so I was sort of just in and out wherever was needed um, because we had a few injuries. I did play a lot more. And then when the Americans equalised with there was like 17 seconds left on the clock, obviously we're at the, our defensive end, and I looked at the uh, halfway and I thought, jeez. <laughs> I looked at the bench and I went, oh, that's closer uh, because I figured that we were going to extra time. So I actually put my hand up to get out. Uh, Ishvan made three or four changes. Yvette was one of them that got in. And uh, you know, I'm sitting there on the side of the pool sucking in all those disgusting carbohydrate liquid things that you, you get for the uh, uh, extra time in case it came. And, uh, of course, we didn't need it, but they came in handy for the party afterwards. But <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because... Yvette was on the TV, obviously, during the week with the uh, Channel 7 that they had, and they actually showed a snippet a little bit longer than what you normally would. And when the footage that they had, you could actually see Yvette, like, with a hand up calling for the ball from Simone, which I actually hadn't noticed. And it wasn't until we were speaking um, at the time, like we just the other night, we were talking about it with Yvette and myself just on Messenger, and she goes, she had forgotten about that. So you can see her calling for the ball, but trying to do it in a way that not the Americans, you know, couldn't see what was happening um, and it was just you know beautiful this one action you know she she caught and uh, let it fly and it actually came off the middle um, defender for the USA Coralie Simmons it just she just got a fingertip to it and then that just pushed it out of reach from the American goalkeeper who you can just see the pain on her face and then it just goes into that top uh, corner and then of course pandemonium broke loose and uh, yeah it was brilliant. Yeah, I remember seeing that. I watched the special the other night and I do remember that exact thing that she was calling for it. And it seemed like, I mean, one second, it seems like about five seconds when you're watching it. But she threw that thing so hard from so far away. When you spoke to her about it, and you've probably spoke to her about it many times over the years, but did she, like, was she, had she seen that in her mind, do you think? Had she visualised that, yep, yeah, give it to me because I am going to score? 
Um, we actually have never spoken about it, but no one would ever doubt. Like, I mean, Yvette is Yvette. Like, she's a different uh, beast, Yvette. She, you know, like, I mean, everyone trained as much as they possibly could, but Yvette always just did that little bit more. And, you know, I would have no doubt that anyone in the team would have taken that shot under pressure, you know, when they needed to do it. But would we have had the same result? Who knows? You know, with Yvette, um, she's just the sort of player that can just, you know, pull something out of the bag. And I, I didn't know that little story that she said on the news the other day on that um, interview the other day where uh, Ishvan I did know that you know he didn't play her always at the beginnings and, and the reasoning was so that the Americans would forget about her because you know she just can cause something from from anywhere and you know it was just so fitting that it was um, it was Evie and just not um, not not surprising at all. Hmm. Well Matt leading into your comp leading into the final tell me did you have like a certainty that you could win or were you just happy to be there? Um, I, no, so like the way the diving comp works is that um, everybody dives in the prelims, so like all 50 divers dive in the prelims um, and then the top 18 make it through to the semifinals and then the top 12 make it through to the finals. And um, in the prelims, I had come second after one Chinese diver, so I went China, me, China. And then in the semi-finals, I came second after the other Chinese diver. So they they swapped. Um, and I don't know, the, like an optimist would have gone like, oh, well, like I've beaten both the Chinese divers, like I have a chance of winning. But like, I I don't know, as a, a realist, <laughs> maybe. Um, and so I thought, okay, well, both Chinese divers have beaten me. So I've got a really good chance of actually winning a bronze medal, which... You know, even that was beyond my wildest dreams, really, because I was just trying to make the team for Beijing. Even though in my mind, like, because I, I, I had had, you know, nearly a year off um, and, you know, and I came back only 15 months before the Beijing Games. So I thought, you know, that's not ideal timing. Let's just try and make the team. And but every every single dive I did in that 15 months, I thought I put myself in that position standing on the end. And I thought, okay, this dive is for Olympic gold. Mm. And like, I, I did it every single dive in that 15 months because I did not, I needed to make the most of that entire 15 months. And I did not want to take my foot off the gas pedal once. Um, and so, you know, even though in my mind, I was always thinking about Olympic gold, um, you know, this, I don't know, the, I, I guess this, this, this self protection mechanism, this mentality was always like aim high, but expect to load that way you're either prepared or pleasantly surprised. Um, and so I was always aiming really, really high. Um, but then when it comes to actually thinking about like, oh, like, you know, I have a chance of actually winning a bronze medal. It's like you have to put all that stuff way out of your mind because that's really unhelpful thinking. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes that can completely derail you because all of a sudden the thinking that you're supposed to be thinking gets completely distracted. And I would hazard to say that, that thought that you had at training for all those months leading up of this is my gold medal dive, it just completely imprinted that on your subconscious. So by the time you stood there on the platform, like what were you thinking? Could you see anything? Did you hear the crowd? What were you feeling just before <laughs> that dive? That, um, oh, God, I was so skinny. <laughs> <laughs> what were you thinking, I'm sure? <laughs> well, I was actually, you can, if you watch the footage of me walking to the end um, for my last dive, you can see me doing my hair. So I'm obviously aware that there are millions of eyes watching me. Um, so I want to look good. Um, when I got to the end of the platform, I was, the, and I was doing that last dive, I thought, this is just like training. Like there is nothing more that I can do now. So just relax, enjoy yourself and have fun. Because, you know, it's, I didn't need to say, okay, this is for Olympic gold because I was already like that sort of, you know, that, that, that um, excited, like that aroused, I guess, um, uh, in the non, non erotic meaning of the word. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't need to put any more pressure on myself. So I was just like, yeah, just chill. this is just like training. I've practiced this moment like literally a million times. Um, and, you know, I, it was, it was kind of like a bit, you know, in the zone moment kind of thing where it's like, you know, the, the rows of people on either side of you just like fade to nothingness and, you know, it feels like time slows down and yeah, it's, um, and then I just can't remember the dive at all. The next thing I remember is being underwater going, I wonder if that was good. I wonder if, like, I wonder if, would it, 
what would it mean if it was good? What would it mean if it wasn't good? That would be worse. And, like, it's amazing the amount of dialogue you can have underwater. Um, but I was actually I was scared. I was scared to surface because I didn't know what the outcome would. I knew it was going to be big either way. And how long did you stay under there for? Was it longer than normal or was it, like? Definitely longer than normal. But I was scared to find out the outcome. And um, when I when my lungs wouldn't let me stay under the water any longer, I did finally surface and saw the crowd going absolutely batshit crazy, like jumping up and down, throwing their green and yellow wigs onto the pool deck. Like, and that's when I knew that it was a good dive. Um, yeah. And like I'd, I had had this thought, this very, very brief thought before the dive thinking, if my name comes up on top of the leaderboard after this dive, I've got an Olympic silver medal because I just assumed that the Chinese diver after me was going to win. And, um, and I had to push that out of my mind because I, like, I didn't, that was really unhelpful because like I knew how to dive my absolute best. I didn't need thoughts like, Oh, if I just try a little extra harder, like I'm going to, you know, be able to maybe do it. No, that, that's really unhelpful. So then when my name did come up on top of the leaderboard, I lost it, like <laughs> ugly crying, because an Olympic silver medal was beyond my wildest dreams. It was beyond what I ever thought that I would ever be special enough to achieve. And then the Chinese diver after me absolutely bombed it. So um, then I won. And it was like, like I just, it was so unbelievable. The entire diving community, all the athletes, all the coaches, all the support staff from every country just engulfed me mm. there on the deck and all waited patiently for their turn to congratulate me. And it was beautiful. Mm. And I guess it made everything that you'd been through to that point um, so much more worthwhile or worthwhile going through everything that you'd been through. Oh, my God. The Honestly, the primary feeling I had when I stepped onto the dais was relief, that it had all been worth it. Mm. Deb, what did it feel like when you stepped on the dais? With the team i think it was just surreal for us it was just it was like that um you know our parents couldn't have scripted it for us you know it was such a dream to finally get there and you know all the all the stars or all the ducks lined up on that particular day and it, it was it was actually unbelievable for us you know not only were we at the finally at an olympic games we're in the grand final and we actually won so to stand on the desk and look around we're almost like pinching ourselves like going oh my god do you believe it actually a funny little story i remember after um we did win and we we're all like the crowd obviously were going berserk and we were sort of like waving to people in the stands there were so many people that we knew and i remember uh bronwyn uh smith or Bronnie mayer she goes um do you think we should go in now because people are going to think we've got big heads <laughs> 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 we were actually worried that people were going to think, oh, look at those wankers waving at everyone because, like, we'd never experienced something like that. And, you know, like, we were just over the moon, of course, and the crowd were just mental. But, you know, we were just worried about what other people thought. It was just bizarre. But, yeah, well, look, it was so um, so exhilarating and just so unbelievable that we were we were there. It was just, you know, it was, it was incredible. It still is incredible and it still is something that, you know, like, we fought so long and so hard and now all of a sudden it's 20 years ago that that seems incredible too ah just a couple of years ago yes. um dev i know a lot of people want to know the answer to this one <laughs> what really happens underwater and what is allowed to happen underwater uh, um, well, whatever can go underwater it goes underwater because the referees can't, can only actually call what they can see, right? So there's lots of holding and pulling and pushing. And uh, it look, the game is a lot rougher, a lot more physical now than what it used to be. We, I think, our game was a lot more uh, skill based. We were um, we went faster, but our, our skills were different. Our skill set was different. We played a much more free flowing, open game. It was heavy. There was contact. Um, but now almost the first movement when people play, as soon as they get near someone, they hold each other. Whereas we, we didn't nest, we did hold and we did do all that sort of stuff, but it wasn't our first movement, you know. It was almost like if all else fails, then you'd grab and you'd pull past, you know. And so the game has changed a lot. So, look, yes, heaps of broken, like ripped costumes, heaps of, you know, you accidentally Wedgie? hit someone. Uh, wedgies, yeah, the wedgies are designed now. You've seen those Brazilian, well, you wear them. <laughs> Uh, they're designed to go up your 
clacker. I don't know how they do it. Like, um, yeah, look, times have changed in 20 years. But, look, it's a rough <laughs> game. You're allowed to do lots of stuff. You know, you certainly get sent out on brutality if, if things, are, you know, go too far. Um, it's not something that I actually like in the, the new game. I think I think a lot of girls' sport has gone that way. I think netball's too rough, you know. Like, they take each other out in there. At the end of the day, you know, it's a sport, it's a game, you know, we're girls. I'm not saying that we play gently because we didn't do it either. But I think, you know, we've sort of, uh, the games uh, now are just really quite brutal yeah. at times, which I, I'm not a great fan of. We'll leave that to the Rugby Sevens girls, won't we? <laughs> so I guess that got you ready for your TV career in uh, Gladiator. Oh, <laughs> God, that was oh, the... our pictures, Luke. There she is. Uh, that was Bye. one of the funniest things we did, honestly. We we got to do a few good, fun things, and that was a celebrity one. That was actually in January, I think, January or February maybe in 96. So it was after World uh, Cup, and we used to have good breaks back in the 80s, you know, like after World Champs, you know, you would have a good six weeks off training, like, and it was active um, recovery, you know, like you'd get up and I don't even think we had remote controls in those days, you know, sort of get up and turn the TV, but you had a really good break. So that was six weeks after we'd won World uh, Cup and we had had a lot of rest and a lot of partying and stuff. And it was so much fun. We actually got absolutely towed up by the uh, the gladiators themselves, but we had an absolute ball. <laughs> well, you look pretty good. You look the part. Hey, Matt, you were obviously born to be a performer, whether it was in sport or after sport. Um, Dancing with the Stars, you came second. Pretty amazing. Yep. The cabarets, like, incredible. Sorry. I was distracted by my own crutch. <laughs> Is that picture on the left, is that from the cabarets? No, that was actually um, uh, an auction. Um, I was raising... Uh, oh, you auctioning auction. off there? Yes, I was, yes, auctioning off um, the togs with my with my musk in it. Um, and they fetched a good price. Um, so that was for the Melbourne Cabaret Festival um, in 2013, I think. So are you going to go back doing cabarets as soon as things open up again? What's the plan? What's next? For Matt Mitchum. Um, so I like I love entertaining people. Um, I am open. I mean, the Melbourne Fringe Festival um, have approached me to put something together for the second half of this year. So it's, de it's something definitely something that um, you know, whether it's on stage or on TV or on radio, um, I I just love sort of entertaining. Um, and so I will not discriminate uh, as to <laughs> what the medium will be. So you're open for offers and good luck. Very open. Can't wait. I've heard you sing today. I was watching some of your YouTube videos and you've got a pretty good voice. Um, now it's time to do our rapid 60 second sprint um, where we ask you questions one at a time. So who would like to go first? Matt. Oh, I was just, okay, ladies first then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. All right, 60 seconds on the clock. Here we go. How long can you hold your breath for? 30 seconds. Oh, that's not very good. Daniel can hold his for like two minutes and 20 seconds. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh. Did you ever get, oh, this is the M18 plus. Quick. Okay, so should I take this one as well? What? What was that? Should I take this one as well then? Yeah, no, You. this is still all for you. So did, oh, yeah. did you okay. ever get a stiffy while you were... <laughs> Absolutely not. I, my trunks are way too tight for any circulation to occur. <laughs> okay. When's the last time? Uh, sorry. Did you jump on? Did oh God? I'm completely distracted. <laughs> Do you jump on a trampoline now for fun? Um. Yep. Yeah, a little bit. Whenever I come across one on the street. <laughs> And you just wow everyone. Um, were there any cue words that you used just before you dove in the pool? Um, make it queer. <laughs> <laughs> did you sleep the night before your finals? I did very well. Um, what? Who's the most famous person you've ever met? I got really close to, um, I got invited to um, uh, What's His Face's party, um, George, no, um, yeah, George Michael. I got invited to George Michael's party. I, I decided not to go because I was in recovery. Um, so, and I knew that that was going to be a bad, bad, bad 
environment for me to be in. So, um, so in one way, I'm glad. I, no, in one way, I'm like devastated that I, I didn't go. But in another way, like, you know, I'm still clean and sober. So, yeah, cool. Um, and one more question Is your medal still in mint condition or is it all rubby? Um, it's got a big dent in it from dropping it. It's, I just happen to have it on. Uh, so like, we've got it. See, right there. You can see where I dropped it. Oh, right. yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Um, but and it's the lanyard that's mostly a bit tatty um, because it's silk and it's like you know you've got this here that's very got very sharp jaggedy edges and then you've got Chinese silk ribbons so it's uh, the, the ribbons a bit frayed. Yeah, I found that happens with all the medals. Yeah, lots of hands on there and yeah, throwing it around. <laughs> Good one, awesome, Deb. Are you ready? Six I'm ready. My, I'm not going to get the same ones. So. Hope. <laughs> no, you won't get the same ones. Did, did, did you ever get a stiffy, Deb? Oh. <laughs> No. <laughs> Did you sleep before your final matches? Uh, not a lot. Yeah, funny. We found most men sleep no problem and the women don't. Um, what did you visualise before the big games? Uh, probably not so much before the big games. I did a lot of visualisation actually when I was like months before when I was like sleeping and dreaming and all that. So not, not so much before. It was the earlier prep for me. Part of the prep. Um, would you rather be the best player in the worst team or the worst player in the best team? Well, my theory of coming back uh, for the Olympics was that if I'm sitting on the bench, we're going to have a bloody good team. Nice. Um, what did the team do the night you won? We went to the Gladesville Hotel and absolutely drank it dry uh, with thousands of people. I think it closed down after that. We had an absolute ball. We did do Roy in HG as well. How long can you hold your breath for underwater? Now? No, then. <laughs> oh, then. Oh, never. Oh, I've, uh, as long as necessary. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. Have you ever had a ball pegged right in your the end of your nose? Yeah, your I did. Actually, down at the AIS, probably about eight weeks after I'd had surgery to straight to repair another break. It was actually quite funny. We were down at the AIS at a training camp, and I was just back playing and uh, because I'd had it straightened so I could breathe and all the rest of it. And Simone Hankin pegged this ball at me and it just I was sitting up to defend and I was looking at it and it just went boing. And funny enough, it was caught on uh, camera because Channel 7 were down there filming. I came up going, <laughs> So, everybody. yes. Um, and last question, how's your medal doing? Uh, mine's probably a little bit similar to Matt. It's, it's quite peely. I, mine's in my sock drawer. Um, you know, like thousands of hands have touched it. It needs a really thorough clean and it smells a bit. It smells a bit like a prawn cocktail because I reckon back in those days you went to so many functions and prawn cocktails were the, the function, then you'd stick it in your sock, stick it in your drawer and it'd stay there till the next one. So it's oh. pretty cute. Oh, my gosh, that's hilarious. Well, that's it for my questions. Luke, do you want to come in? Is there any questions in the chat box that we haven't answered or that Matt hasn't answered? I just want to say, after 17 weeks of the Cupper of Life Cafe, is the first stiffy question we've ever had in it, mate. So we're done. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going, I'm going to kick off with Debbie first. Uh, Matt, uh, hold on. Uh, yeah, Debbie, when you were at your peak, what did you do to stay grounded to ensure you didn't become overconfident and lose your focus and hunger? What was the question from Rob. Uh, well, funny enough, I'm not, a, I'm not a particularly confident person, so for me to become overconfident really couldn't happen, I don't think. If anything, I'd always have doubts about what I was um, doing, and I just always made sure that I trained harder than everyone else or, or smarter than everyone else as well. Um, there were plenty of people faster, bigger, stronger, all those things, but I knew that no one was going to work harder or be as prepared as me. So there was always someone I was chasing in some way, even if they were not real. I just had them in my mind that I was going. So, yeah, that was never a problem for me. Uh, another question for you, Debbie, because uh, Matt's already answered this one in the chat room. Given your experiences, both achievements and challenges, are you still involved in any way with your sports? Uh, yeah, I, I have been actually. I've I've coached a lot over the years. Um, I just was probably my favourite thing that I've done recently uh, for the last, I, I took the Born 2000 um, under 18 girls, they were to their world championships. So I went the first time on their tour as a um, manager, which was a ball. And then the next time I went, the assistant coach who was Taryn from our 2000 team, she couldn't go. So I went as assistant coach slash manager. 
uh, and I got to do that, and that was an absolutely amazing experience. I still I still do coach, so yes, I am involved. So good. Um, before we head off today, please make sure that you do make a donation in the offers area uh, for the Australian Sports Foundation. 16,000 clubs are in danger of shutting their doors, as I mentioned at the start. Any donation is tax deductible as well, so please make sure you click on the offers area right now and do make that donation before you head off tonight. Uh, Kerry, have you got something special for us? Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to thank Matthew and Debbie so much for, like, giving us your time on a Saturday night. I know you've got so many other things to do, Matt, in Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been awesome. We loved hearing your stories. We wish you both heaps and heaps of luck in the future in all your endeavours. It's been amazing hearing your stories. Also, thanks to Luke for having us. Thanks to Jill, Nikki and Charlie for always, you know, backing us up. Uh, up before and after these um, these webinars. And I want to leave you with this, guys. Tonight's quote is, the road to success is always under construction. So just keep going. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Please give a wave of gratitude in the chat room. Uh, we'll see you later tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, our last oh, night, Anna Mears and Kieran Perkins. Woo! Right, Thank you. Get everyone involved. See you later. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Love it. Bye. <laughs>